We've had a good weekend with Ron and Don Williams here and with their wives and got to spend some time with them yesterday afterwards. And uh, uh, this, we've, I think we've learned a lot about dementia and cancer, but at this time I'd like to introduce Ron Williams and I'm sure he's gonna do a good for, job for us uh, from the pulpit as well. indeed very good to be with you today and certainly in in our audience we welcome your new minister and his wife and I know that you're looking forward to getting to know him as he and his wife as they begin to work with you in this wonderful congregation. Don and I and Bonnie and Lisa are very grateful for your kindness. Uh, when congregations invite us first for a grief workshop and then they invite us next time Again, for a different kind of seminar, I guess you're gluttons for punishment or something like that. But certainly we appreciate so very much your hospitality, uh, your kindness. Uh, so many individuals have worked hard for this in publications and getting the information out. Certainly to Sean, we appreciate the hospitality yesterday afternoon, the meal together. Uh, David, we appreciate so much. I wish for him the very, very best. Norma, be sure to tell him hello for us. And I guess it would be appropriate to say roll tide to him. It would not be appropriate to say roll tide to him. Okay, whatever. Go Kansas City. How, how about that? Anyway, Thea and Philip, we appreciate again uh, all their work that they've done and what they mean to this church as well. We're just very grateful. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the text that was already read a moment ago, Paul makes the point that we belong to one another. That instead of us being many bodies, we're many members in one body. Now he started out that particular book to a church that was fragmented in, in so many different ways with this plea. 1 Corinthians 1.10 I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. So from the very beginning of the book, in regard to the different things that Paul was going to deal with, and believe me, he deals with a lot of things in the book of 1 Corinthians, and again in 2 Corinthians as well. He starts out with a preface, you need to be of the same judgment in the same mind. And particularly here in the context of the passage of 1 Corinthians 12, that's exactly the point that he's making. All of you are important in the one body of Christ. Amen. Earlier on, he's already said, you know, different members of the body may seem insignificant, may seem unimportant. But he says, as he makes the point, you know, because we're just one body, not many bodies, you've got to have eyes that work, you've got to have fingers that work, you've got to have toes that work, you've got to have everything working together. Amen. And sadly, the, fa the fact of the matter is, as Paul says, when one member hurts, then we're all supposed to hurt together. You've already had a special prayer for a dear church member this morning and praying for him and for his family. You know, the fact of the matter is we're all going to hurt at one time or the other. Amen. Sometimes someone is told, thank you for your 30 years of service to our company. We're downsizing, but your skills are no longer needed here. Or... Sometimes the announcements may read, pray for the Smiths as they both go undergo a, another round of chemo and, and radiation for their cancer. Or pray for the Jones family as they travel down south to be with family members who were killed in a car accident. Or sometimes the message may, be, may come from the hospital, I'm sorry but they didn't make it through the surgery. Or sometimes young parents have to say to their, or young children 
that are married have to say to their mom and dad, we're no longer pregnant. I lost a child of miscarriage. Or we're going to have to move mom to one of our homes because she's no longer lucid like she used to be. And, 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 and it's dangerous for her to be by herself. All these are messages. All these are statements that make, the, make us understand that we all hurt at one time or the other. And what Paul was saying in this passage of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, particularly around 25, verse 26, is you're all going to hurt. But the fact of the matter is we need to be hurting together. I looked up the passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26, in different translations other than the ones that we typically go to. For example, there's one called the Bible in basic English version. Listen to 1 Corinthians 12, 26. And if there is pain in one part of the body, all the parts will be feeling it. Or if one part is honored, all the parts will be glad. In another translation, again, that we typically don't look at, the Aramaic Bible in plain English, 1 Corinthians 12, 26. So now when all members, when, when, when one member will suffer, all of them can share the pain. And if one member rejoices, all the members shall rejoice. What Paul was trying to say is we are a family, and thus we all hurt together. Now, the problem is this. We tend to be very personal and private and me-driven when it comes to a problem. When we hear an announcement made of someone that is sick or someone that's ailing, someone that's got bad news, received bad news from the, from the doctor or from the hospital, the case, we think, okay, that's so-and-so's job. It's the elder's responsibility. It's now the new minister's responsibility. It's somebody else besides me. And so we start thinking, okay, they'll be taken care of so I don't have to do anything. Let's just be honest. We all do that. Even ministers. Okay, that falls under the category of the elders, or that falls in the category of the deacons. And so I'll just let them, I'll just take a vacation from that problem. And thus, unfortunately, what happens is thinking that someone else will take care of the issue, nobody takes care of the issue. And thus, another member of the Lord's church suffers alone. You remember the parable of the Samaritan? We call him the Good Samaritan, Luke chapter, 10, uh, Luke chapter 10. He asked the question to our Lord on one occasion, Lord, who's my neighbor? And then Jesus gave a word picture. He talked about a man that was rot, robbed and beaten and left half dead. A priest comes by, doesn't even go to the other side to check on him. A Levite comes, he does look, and then he passes on to the other side as well. And then, of all people, Jesus talks about a Samaritan. The, the Jews consider them half-breeds, the enemies of the Jews. But he came and had compassion and took care of him. In fact, in, in the context of the passage, Luke chapter 10, a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. You want to know what the church is supposed to do when someone hurts? We're supposed to go where they are. And when he had seen him, he had compassion on him. In other words, he, he had a feeling in his heart, and then he went and he bound bandaged up his wounds, pouring in war and wine. And then he set him on his own beast, a burden, and took him to the inn and took care of him. You see, compassion is not just, I hope things get better for you. 
And it's not just even writing a note of love, even though we mean in that, lo- that note of love to show compassion and sympathy and care and concern and understanding about their problem. But it's doing much more than that. And the point of the matter was, that's exactly the point that Jesus was making in the text. Here's a man that no one expected to help anybody, and yet look at what he did. He went way past the second mile in taking care of a total stranger. And remember that he also left money as he left to go on about his business, his business trip. He said, left money with the end. You take care of this, of him. And anything I owe you, I'll take care of when I come back again. And do you remember what Jesus asked? Which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And of course, the man asking that question had to say, he who sure showed mercy on him. And Jesus said what? Go do likewise. Go practice compassion in action. You see, we forget that we have a duty to hurt with others. Job 14.1, Job lamented, man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. And that's true. 2020 was not a good year that most of us will write home about because of all the difficulties and challenges that we all face, regardless of whether you got COVID or whether you didn't get COVID. You all knew someone that did. And we hurt with people. And yet, we were, I, so many times our hands were tied because of what we were not able to do. John 16, 13. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. Then notice what Jesus said. In the world you will have tribulation. Mark it down, folks. In this world you have tri- tribulation. But then notice the last part. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12, verse 10, be kindly affection, that is, be in love with one another, with brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another. Amen. And so that means for the Laura congregation, and it means for my congregation, the Lincoln congregation back in Huntsville, Alabama, that, that when it comes to the people that I'm to prefer, the people that are on the top of my list, it's not me, myself, and I, It's my church members. It's my church family. It's those who are hurting that need for me to show preference to and caring for them. 1 John 3, verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. In other words, don't just talk a good fight. Don't just talk a a good idea. Do something about it. You see, hurting alone hurts more. Think about that for just a moment. Hearing the comment from a doctor, the surgeon, there is nothing else to be done for your loved one. It's much more alarming and disturbing when you're alone. And some of you have been there when such a comment was made. Receiving an unfavorable diagnosis from from a scan is much more unsettling when you're by yourself we talked this week in regard to the this, this past couple of days in regard to, to cancer that, that, you know, when it comes to diagnosis, every single person can remember the, exactly where they were, the time of the day, and likely who was there and who wasn't there when they heard the words, you have cancer. And the same would be true for someone of your loved ones that has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia. And unfortunately, sometimes you're by yourself when that happens. When did the demons come out at night? Come to possess your thoughts and your faith out at night? When you're by yourself in the darkest of the night, is when sometimes the terrible news comes. 
When we look at 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 26, we need to remember that that passage is not just about elders, and it's not just about preachers, and it's not just about deacons or committee chairmen of different groups. It has reference to one group and one group only, the Lord's church, the one body of Christ. That's the point he's making. It's not a, it's not a delegation. It's not, it's not the, 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 the leadership. It's everyone. Amen. Because we're all members one of another. Amen. And therefore, if I remember that, that I am to hurt with others, then, then it will make, I will make sure that instead of me being me, myself, and I in regard to my needs and my concerns first and foremost, I'm going to work at being interconnected, not independent from my fellow members. And the result, as Paul mentioned there in 1 Corinthians 12, 25, is that there will be no schism, no discord, no disharmony with the body of Christ. Instead of Christians hurting alone, they will hurt together. Now we understand this. We're all going to hurt individually with or without our church members. When you go for a di- cancer diagnosis, when you, when you go and sit down with a neurologist concerning a study that's been done on your loved one in regard to their brain and what their activity and all those, you, you're going to hurt. But the question is, are we going to hurt by ourselves? or are we going to have others there? And they may not be presently right there with us, but we know that there's just one phone call or one email or one text that needs to be made that will quickly have an army of people come to take care of us, to see to our needs, to pray for us, to provide physical needs like food and other things that will constantly, before the throne of God, mention our name and remind us that we are not alone in our pain. I don't know who wrote this, but I love it. My friend I care, as it's called. Don't tell me that you understand. Don't tell me that you know. Don't tell me that I will survive, how I will surely grow. Don't tell me that this is just a test, that I am truly blessed that I am chosen for this task, apart from all of the rest. Don't come at me with answers that can only come from me. And don't tell me how my grief will pass, that I will soon be free. Don't stand in pious judgment of the bonds I must untie. Don't tell me how to suffer and don't tell me how to cry. Accept me in my ups and downs. I need someone to share. Just hold my hand and let me cry and say, my friend, I care. That's what we all need in life. And we need it more than anything else in the Lord's church to start here right now and then to move out into the community in which you live to let folks know there's a, there's a place in town you can come to find compassion. There's a place in town where you can come to find understanding. There's a place in town where someone cares. And I hope and I pray that it's the Laurel Church of Christ or that it's the Lincoln Church of Christ or where Don works, the Florence Boulevard Church of Christ. It's where people 
understand that they are all members of one body and one body only. Amen. And for that reason, we walk together. Robert Browning Hamilton wrote these words as we close. I walked a mile with pleasure. She chatted all the way. For she left me none the wiser for all that she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, and ne'er a word she said. But oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. In this life, we will have tribulation, Jesus said. But be of good cheer, he said. I've overcome the world. Amen. And Paul says, remember that you're members of one body. We either hurt together, we laugh together, we rejoice together, Romans 12, 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Perhaps there's someone in this audience this, after, this morning that needs to say, I've not done my part publicly. Maybe you need to do it. I hope all of us respond privately because we all need to. Let's admit it. We, we all fail in this regard. If there's someone that needs to come and just ask for the prayers of the church because they're hurting and they need someone to hurt with them, maybe you're not a New Testament Christian. You need to become one this morning or you need to come back to his church. We invite you to come. It's together. We stand and sing the invitation song together.